You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Today's offering is a ghost story by the great Edward Lucas White, The House of the Nightmare. This one was first published in Smith's Magazine in September 1906. We hope you enjoy it. The House of the Nightmare by Edward Lucas White I first caught sight of the house from the brow of the mountain as I cleared the woods and looked across the broad valley several hundred feet below me to the low sun sinking toward the far blue hills. From that momentary viewpoint, I had an exaggerated sense of looking almost vertically down. I seemed to be hanging over the checkerboard of roads and fields, dotted with farm buildings, and felt the familiar deception that I could almost throw a stone upon the house. I barely glimpsed its slate roof. What caught my eyes was the bit of road in front of it, between the mass of dark green shade trees about the house and the orchard opposite. Perfectly straight it was, bordered by an even row of trees, through which I made out a cinder side path and a low stone wall. Conspicuous on the orchard side between two of the flanking trees was a white object, which I took to be a tall stone, a vertical splinter of one of the tilted limestone reefs with which the fields of the region are scarred. The road itself I saw plain as a boxwood ruler on a green baize table. It gave me a pleasurable anticipation of a chance for a burst of speed. I had been painfully traversing closely forested, semi-mountainous hills. Not a farmhouse had I passed, only a wretched cabins by the road, more than twenty miles of which I had found very bad and hindering. Now, when I was not many miles from my expected stopping place, I looked forward to the better going, and to that straight level bit in particular. As I sped cautiously down the sharp beginning of the long descent, the trees engulfed me again, and I lost sight of the valley. I dipped into a hollow, rose on the crest of the next hill, and again saw the house, nearer and not so far below. The tall stone caught my eye with a shock of surprise. Had I not thought it was opposite the house next the orchard? Clearly it was on the left-hand side of the road toward the house. My self-questioning lasted only the moment as I passed the crest. Then the outlook was cut off again, but I found myself gazing ahead, watching for the next chance at the same view. At the edge of the second hill I only saw the bit of road obliquely, and could not be sure, but as at first the tall stone seemed on the right of the road. At the top of the third and last hill, I looked down the stretch of road under the overarching trees, almost as one would look through a tube. There was a line of whiteness which I took for the tall stone. It was on the right. I dipped into the last hollow. As I mounted the farther slope, I kept my eyes on the top of the road ahead of me. When my line of sight surmounted the rise— I marked the tall stone on my right hand among the serried maples. I leaned over first on one side, then on the other, to inspect my tires. Then I threw the lever. As I flew forward, I looked ahead. There was the tall stone, on the left of the road. I was really scared and almost dazed. I meant to stop dead, take a good look at the stone, and make up my mind beyond peradventure whether it was on the right or the left if not indeed in the middle of the road. In my bewilderment I put on the highest speed. The machine leaped forward. Everything I touched went wrong. I steered wildly, slewed to the left, and crashed into a big maple. When I came to my senses I was flat on my back in the dry ditch. The last rays of the sun sent shafts of golden-green light through the maple boughs overhead. My first thought was an odd mixture of appreciation of the beauties of nature and disapproval of my own conduct in touring without a companion. 
a fad I had regretted more than once. Then my mind cleared, and I sat up. I felt myself from the head down. I was not bleeding, no bones were broken, and, while much shaken, I had suffered no serious bruises. Then I saw the boy. He was standing at the edge of the cinder-path, near the ditch. He was stocky and solidly built, barefoot with his trousers rolled up to his knees, wore a sort of butternut shirt open at the throat, and was coatless and hatless. He was tow-headed, with a shock of tousled hair, was much freckled, and had a hideous hair lip. He shifted from one foot to the other, twiddled his toes, and said nothing whatever, though he stared at me intently. I scrambled to my feet and proceeded to survey the wreck. It seemed distressingly complete. It had not blown up, nor even caught fire, but otherwise the ruin appeared hopelessly thorough. Everything I examined seemed worse smashed than the rest. My two hampers alone, by one of those cynical jokes of chance, had escaped. Both had pitched clear of the wreckage and were unhurt, not even a bottle broken. During my investigations, the boy's faded eyes followed me continuously, but he uttered no word. When I had convinced myself of my helplessness, I straightened up and addressed him. "'How far is it to a blacksmith's shop?' Eight mile,' he answered. He had a distressing case of cleft palate, and was scarcely intelligible. "'Can you drive me there?' I inquired. "'Nary team on the place.' he replied. Nary horse, nary cow. How far to the next house? I continued. Six mile, he responded. I glanced at the sky. The sun had set already. I looked at my watch. It was going seven thirty-six. May I sleep in your house tonight? I asked. You can come in if you want to, he said, and sleep if you can. House all messy. Ma's been dead three year, and Dad's away. "'Nothing to eat but buckwheat flour and rusty bacon.' "'I've plenty to eat,' I answered, picking up a hamper. "'Just take that hamper, will you?' "'You can come in if you're a mind to,' he said. "'But you've got to carry your own stuff.' He did not speak gruffly or rudely, but appeared mildly stating an inoffensive fact. "'All right,' I said. "'Lead the way.' The yard in front of the house was dark— under a dozen or more immense ailanthus trees. Below them, many smaller trees had grown up, and beneath these, a dank underwood of tall, rank suckers out of the deep, shaggy, matted grass. What had once been, apparently, a carriage drive left a narrow, curved track, disused and grass-grown, leading to the house. Even here were some shoots of the ailanthus, and the air was unpleasant with the vile smell of the roots and suckers and the insistent odour of their flowers. The house was of grey stone, with green shutters faded almost as grey as the stone. Along its front was a veranda, not much raised from the ground, and with no balustrade or railing. On it were several hickory-splint rockers. There were eight shuttered windows toward the porch, and midway of them a wide door— with small violet panes on either side of it, and a fanlight above. "'Open the door,' I said to the boy. "'Open it yourself,' he replied, not unpleasantly nor disagreeably, but in such a tone that one could not but take the suggestion as a matter of course. I put down the two hampers and tried the door. It was latched, but not locked, and opened with a rusty grind of its hinges— on which it sagged crazily, scraping the floor as it turned. The passage smelt mouldy and damp. There were several doors on either side. The boy pointed to the first on the right. "'You can have that room,' he said. I opened the door. What with the dusk, the interlacing trees outside, the piazza roof and the closed shutters, I could make out little. "'Better get a lamp,' I said to the boy." "'Nary lamp,' he declared cheerfully. "'Nary candle. Mostly I get a bed before dark.' I returned to the remains of my conveyance. All four of my lamps were merely scrap metal and splintered glass. 
My lantern was smashed flat. I always, however, carried candles in my valise. This I found split and crushed, but still holding together. I carried it to the porch, opened it, and took out three candles. Entering the room, where I found the boy standing just where I had left him, I lit the candle. The walls were whitewashed, the floor bare. There was a mildewed, chilly smell, but the bed looked freshly made up and clean, although it felt clammy. With a few drops of its own grease, I stuck the candle on the corner of a mean, rickety little bureau. There was nothing else in the room, save two rush-bottomed chairs and a small table. I went out on the porch, brought in my valise, and put it on the bed. I raised the sash of each window, and pushed open the shutters. Then I asked the boy, who had not moved or spoken, to show me the way to the kitchen. He led me straight through the hall to the back of the house. The kitchen was large, and had no furniture, save some pine chairs, a pine bench, and a pine table. I stuck two candles on opposite corners of the table. There was no stove or range in the kitchen, only a big hearth, the ashes in which smelt and looked a month old. The wood in the woodshed was dry enough, but even it had a celery, stale smell. The axe and hatchet were both rusty and dull, but usable, and I quickly made a big fire. To my amazement, for the mid-June evening was hot and still, the boy, a wry smile on his ugly face, almost leaned over the flame, hands and arms spread out, and fairly roasted himself. "'Are you cold?' I inquired. "'I'm all as cold,' he replied, hugging the fire, closer than ever, till I thought he must scorch. I left him toasting himself while I went in search of water. I discovered the pump, which was in working order and not dry on the valves, but I had a furious struggle to fill the two leaky pails I had found. When I had put water to boil, I fetched my hampers from the porch. I brushed the table and set out my meal. Cold fowl, cold ham, white and brown bread, olives, jam, and cake. When the can of soup was hot and the coffee made, I drew up two chairs to the table and invited the boy to join me. "'I ain't hungry,' he said. "'I've had supper.' He was a new sort of boy to me. All the boys I knew were hearty eaters and always ready. I had felt hungry myself, but somehow when I came to eat I had little appetite and hardly relished the food. I soon made an end of my meal, covered the fire, blew out the candles, and returned to the porch, where I dropped into one of the hickory rockers to smoke. The boy followed me silently, and seated himself on the porch floor, leaning against a pillar, his feet on the grass outside. "'What do you do?' I asked, when your father is away. "'Just loaf round,' he said. "'Just fool round.' "'How far off are your nearest neighbours? I asked. "'Don't know neighbours never come here,' he stated. "'Say they're afeard of the ghosts.' I was not at all startled. The place had all those aspects which lead to a house being called haunted. I was struck by his odd matter-of-fact way of speaking. It was as if he had said they were afraid of a cross-dog. "'Do you ever see any ghosts around here?' I continued. "'Never see them he answered, as if I had mentioned tramps or partridges. Never hear them. Sort of feel them round sometimes. Are you afraid of them? I asked. Nope, he declared. I ain't scared of ghosts. I'm scared of nightmares. Ever have nightmares? Very seldom, I replied. I do, he returned. Always have the same nightmare. Big sow, large as a steer, trying to eat me up. Wake up so scared I could run to never. Nowhere's to run to. Go to sleep and have it again. Wake up worse scared than ever. Dad says it's buckwheat cakes in summer. You must have teased a sow some time, I said. Yep, he answered. Teased a big sow once, holding up one of her pigs by the hind leg. Teased her too long. Fell in the pen and got bit up some. Wished I hadn't to teased her. Have that nightmare three times a week sometimes. Worse than being burnt out. Worse than ghosts. Say, I 
sort of feel ghosts around now. He was not trying to frighten me. He was as simply stating an opinion as if he had spoken of bats or mosquitoes. I made no reply, and found myself listening involuntarily. My pipe went out. I did not really want another, but felt disinclined for bed as yet, and was comfortable where I was, while the smell of the ailanthus blossoms was very disagreeable. I filled my pipe again, lit it, and then, as I puffed, somehow dozed off for a moment. I awoke with a sensation of some light fabric trailed across my face. The boy's position was unchanged. "'Did you do that?' I asked sharply. "'Ain't done nary thing,' he rejoined. "'What was it?' It was like a piece of mosquito netting brushed over my face. "'That ain't netting,' he asserted. "'That's a veil. That's one of the ghosts. Some blow on you, some touch you with their long, cold fingers. That one with the veil she drags across your face. Well, mostly I think it's Ma.' He spoke with the unassailable conviction of the child in We Are Seven. I found no words to reply, and rose to go to bed. "'Good night,' I said. "'Good night,' he echoed. "'I'll set out here a spell yet.' I lit the match, found the candle I had stuck on the corner of the shabby little bureau, and undressed. The bed had a comfortable husk mattress, and I was soon asleep. I had the sensation of having slept some time, when I had a nightmare, the very nightmare the boy had described. A huge sow, big as a dray horse, was reared up on her forelegs over the footboard of the bed, trying to scramble over to me. She grunted and puffed, and I felt I was the food she craved. I knew in the dream that it was only a dream, and strove to wake up. Then— The gigantic dream beast floundered over the footboard, fell across my shins, and I awoke. I was in darkness as absolute as if I were sealed in a jet vault, yet the shudder of the nightmare instantly subsided. My nerves quieted. I realized where I was, and felt not the least panic. I turned over, and was asleep again almost at once. Then I had a real nightmare— not recognizable as a dream, but appallingly real, an unutterable agony of reasonless horror. There was a thing in the room, not a sow, nor any other nameable creature, but a thing. It was as big as an elephant, filled the room to the ceiling, was shaped like a wild boar seated on its haunches, with its forelegs braced stiffly in front of it. It had a hot, slobbering red mouth, full of big tusks, and its jaws worked hungrily. It shuffled and hunched itself forward, inch by inch, till its vast forelegs straddled the bed. The bed crushed up like wet blotting paper, and I felt the weight of the thing on my feet, on my legs, on my body, on my chest. It was hungry, and I was what it was hungry for, and it meant to begin on my face— Its dripping mouth was nearer and nearer. Then the dream helplessness that made me unable to call or move suddenly gave way, and I yelled and awoke. This time my terror was positive, and not to be shaken off. It was near dawn. I could descry dimly the cracked, dirty window panes. I got up, lit the stump of my candle and two fresh ones, dressed hastily, strapped my ruined valise— and put it on the porch against the wall near the door. Then I called the boy. I realized quite suddenly that I had not told him my name, nor asked his. I shouted, Hello, a few times, but won no answer. I had had enough of that house. I was still permeated with the panic of the nightmare. I desisted from shouting, made no search, but with two candles went out to the kitchen. I took a swallow of cold coffee, and munched a biscuit as I hustled my belongings into my hampers. Then, leaving a silver dollar on the table, I carried the hampers out on the porch, and dumped them by my valise. It was now light enough to see to walk, and I went out to the road. Already the night dew had rusted much of the wreck, 
making it look more hopeless than before. It was, however, entirely undisturbed. There was not so much as a wheel track or a hoof print on the road. The tall, white stone, uncertainty about which had caused my disaster, stood like a sentinel opposite where I had upset. I set out to find that blacksmith shop. Before I had gone far, the sun rose clear from the horizon, and almost at once scorching. As I footed it along, I grew very much heated, and it seemed more like ten miles than six before I reached the first house. It was a new frame house, neatly painted and close to the road, with a whitewashed fence along its garden front. I was about to open the gate, when a big black dog with a curly tail bounded out of the bushes. He did not bark, but stood inside the gate wagging his tail and regarding me with a friendly eye. Yet I hesitated, with my hand on the latch, and considered. The dog might not be as friendly as he looked, and the sight of him made me realize that, except for the boy, I had seen no creature about the house where I had spent the night, no dog or cat, not even a toad or bird. While I was ruminating upon this, a man came from behind the house. "'Will your dog bite?' I asked. "'Nah,' he answered. "'He don't bite. Come in.' I told him I had had an accident to my automobile, and asked if he could drive me to the blacksmith shop and back to my wreckage. Sert, he said. "'Happy to help you. I'll hitch up shortly. Where'd you smash?' "'In front of the grey house about six miles back,' I answered. "'That big stone-built house?' he queried. "'The same,' I assented. "'Did you go past here?' he inquired, astonished. "'I didn't hear you.' "'No,' I said. "'I came from the other direction.' "'Why?' he meditated. "'You must have smashed about sun-up. "'Did you come over them mountains in the dark?' "'No,' I replied. "'I came over them yesterday evening. "'I smashed up about sunset.' "'Sundown!' he exclaimed. "'Where in thunder have you been all night?' I slept in the house where I broke down. In that there big stone-built house in the trees? He demanded. Yes, I agreed. Why? He quavered excitedly. That there house is haunted. They say if you have to drive past it after dark, you can't tell which side of the road the big white stone is on. I couldn't tell even before sunset, I said. There, he exclaimed. Look at that now. And you slept in that house? Did you sleep, honest? I slept pretty well, I said. Except for a nightmare. I slept all night. Well, he commented, I wouldn't go in that there house for a farm, nor sleep in it for my salvation. And you slept. How in thunder did you get in? The boy took me in, I said. What sort of a boy? He queried, his eyes fixed on me with a queer, countrified look of absorbed interest. "'A thick-set, uh, freckle-faced boy with a hair lip,' I said. "'Talk like his mouth was full of mush?' he demanded. "'Yes,' I said. "'Bad case of cleft palate.' "'Well!' he exclaimed. "'I never did believe in ghosts, and I never did half believe that house was haunted, but I know it now. And you slept!' "'I didn't see any ghosts,' I retorted irritably. "'You seen a ghost for sure.' he rejoined solemnly. That there hairlip boy's been dead six months. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the Join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.